All right, so let's do some examples of applying these different principles. Here we go. So the first one we've got written up is our uh, species of hydrogen. We're going to do our electron configurations first, and then we'll go back and we'll do, talk about these other things, the diagrams and the noble gas configurations. In order to write out an electron configuration, we need to know a number of things. One, we need to know how many total electrons our species has. So in this case, for hydrogen, how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. One. Okay. So this one is, by definition, just about as easy as it gets. But that's good because it'll help us work through this. Okay, doke. Now, blah, blah, blah. now, in order for us to figure out our electron configuration, we need to know our Aufbau principle, Aufbau, our Huns rule, and Pauli's exclusion principle. All right, you ready? As you're going to be. <laughs> All right. So, let me... I'm trying to think how to do this electronically, because it's really easy to do this in a classroom. Um... Let's go over here first. Nope. Okay. Can you see the periodic table? Yes. All right. I'm going to drag that just so that I'm not covering it. Oh, whatever. Okay. So here's our hydrogen, right? We are up here, and maybe you have wondered, maybe you haven't wondered why hydrogen's up here by its lonesome. So the thing about our periodic table is it gives us a ton of information. For example, the first row across here is going to always give us, well, not always, it's going to often give us what our value of N is going to be um, for the species that we've got. This will make more sense when we do a more complicated uh, atom like nitrogen or potassium. Right now, because we're in row one here, our value of N, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Our value of N is going to be equal to one. We know that because it has one electron where the hydrogen is on the periodic table. It's going to, it's in there in row one. N is going to be equal to one. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. L by definition is N minus one all the way through zero. Since N is equal to one and these three dots that means thus and therefore. Because N was equal to 1, L has to equal for hydrogen 0. Which gives us an S orbital. So we've got a 1S orbital for our hydrogen. We're not going to have a P and we're not going to have any other orbitals because we can't because of how many electrons we've got and where hydrogen was on the periodic table. So like we said, we've got one electron here. There's a couple of ways that we can visualize this 1s orbital now. 
one of the ways that we can do that is our box notation. These like orbital diagrams as boxes. What this says is we draw a box for every one of our orbitals and we would put our label for that orbital under the box. And that box is just way easier to draw than the circle or the sphere. Because really, this is a sphere, right? Well, this is like my bad attempt at trying to make that three-dimensional looking. Looks horrible. So a box is way easier to draw. <laughs> we could also just do a line. And a line is even easier than a box. And we just literally just draw one line. And we can put the 1S underneath that. Okay. Here's where the one electron thing comes into play. The Aufbau principle is going to tell us we can we need to fill our lowest energy orbitals first. And we're going to fill it in one electron at a time. Well, since we only have one orbital and we only have one electron, it makes the Aufbau principle really easy to follow. Hund's rule is going to tell us we need to put our electrons in um, into our orbitals and it's going to dictate the spin on whether we put it spin up or spin down. Well, we only have one electron, so it's going to be easy. It's going to be spin up. And the Pauli exclusion principle is going to say you can't have the same four quantum numbers. It doesn't matter. There's only one electron here. So you can't have duplicates because there's only the one electron. So we would put our one electron with this configuration over here with a half arrow spin up. Or if we were doing the line notation, spin up. If we were doing the electron configuration, we would say 1s and we put in now as a superscript the number of electrons that we can possibly have in that orbital or the number of, I'm sorry, the number of electrons that we actually have in that orbital, which is one. So here is that box notation, here's that line notation, and here's that electron configuration. Now, hydrogen is not going to have a noble gas configuration um, because it's so small. So a noble gas configuration for hydrogen is not going to happen. You with me so far? Yes. Okay, because your question was regarding something that was way more complicated than when I started with, or than this. So now let's do something that's more complicated. Sounds like my kids are trying to destroy the entire upstairs. <laughs> I'm not going to have a house to come back to. I'm just going to stay in the basement. All right. Next species was boron. If we go to the periodic table, periodic table, we see boron is right here. So first off, boron has five electrons. Are you able to hear that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like crazy, isn't it? It's, yeah. Well, it's going to be a fun time in YouTube land. All right. Boron has five electrons. Also, boron is here in the second row. Now, <laughs> I just don't want to stop them because they're happy and yeah. they're playing with their grandma. And they haven't been happy a lot today just because they're both sensitive because whatever. 
<sighs> it's almost like there was a major holiday yesterday and I got a lot of sugar. Um. So, if we look here at the periodic table, we've got this like for group one and two. They kind of stick out here in this kind of like bump section, right? That's two across. If we go over to the other side of the periodic table here, with starting at boron and ending in neon, we have six of these elements. So that's a little bit of a hint for us when we know how to read the hint. But the key thing here is we're in row two and we have five electrons. How is this going to help us? Okay. It's time to start placing our electrons. So here we go. We're going to do our electron configuration uh, first this time. Well, we'll do it in combination, I guess, with everything else. Whatever. First off, alpha principle. Fill your electrons in the lowest energy orbitals first. Well, the literal lowest energy orbital we can have is n equals one, which would mean, oops, which would then mean L equals zero, M sub L equals zero, and we can have M sub S equals one half or negative one half. This set right here corresponds to the quantum numbers for our lowest possible energy configurations for electrons. If we translate this into an electron configuration, we have a 1s. Now the m sub l just tells us the number of s orbitals we have, and because we only have one m sub l value, we only have the one, so we don't do anything there necessarily. Um, we could draw it out though, and we could say 1s1, and then this m sub l value corresponds to us only having one line or one box. And the m sub s then corresponds to spin up or spin down. With me? Yes. Okay, so how many total electrons do we have in that 1s orbital? Just one? Or two. 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 two, right. We have one that's spin up and one that's spin down. So that means for our electron configuration right here, we would say 1s2. That's where the sub superscript 2 is coming from. Okay. It's coming from like this. It's coming from the fact that we have two electrons. You with me? Yes. Okay. So we have placed two electrons using the Aufbau principle, Hund's rule, and the Pauli exclusion principle. Aufbau says fill it in one electron at a time. Hund's rule says make sure the spins are all spinny in the right ways. And the Pauli exclusion principle says, basically, you got to have one electron spin up, one electron spin down in a subshell. Cool? Yep. yep. Five is not equal to two, except for in the state of Texas. <laughs> so we have three more electrons that we need to place. We cannot put them in these orbitals. So that means we have to go to the next available orbital. The next available orbital would have n equal to 2 l. Well, l could be 1 or it could be 0. The lower energy orbital is going to be the one that has the lower value of l. So while l could be 1 or 0, the lower energy one 
will be the zero one. So because of that, we're going to ignore one for right now. If we need more space to put electrons, we'll come back to L equals one. But it will only go there if we need more space. Okay. M sub L is going to be zero and M sub S is going to be one half, negative one half. And so th this scenario is going to be two S. And we could draw out the same kind of diagram over here that looks just like the one that we did up above previously on the page. It all works out the same, right? So our electron configuration, we could say 2s, our uh, line and our box, 2s, 2s. Well, we've got two values of m sub s. So we could do one. and one. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we would write our out our electron configuration out as 2s2 because we have two electrons in our s subshell. Mm -hmm. So to recap, we're now at 1s2 2s2. We can add all the superscript numbers to tell us how many electrons we've placed. So how many electrons have we placed total? Four. Four. Four is not equal to five. Same joke about Texas. So now this is where we have to do the n equals we don't need to change our n value we can still keep it at two we can keep it at two because then we say we could have had l equals one or zero yeah yeah so n doesn't have to change we only need to go to n, a higher value of n principal quantum number if we run out of subshells we haven't we used up the 2s but we can have L equals one, which would be P. Now our M sub L is gonna equal negative one, zero, or one. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna write this a different way. I'm gonna do it like this. It can be equal to negative one, zero, or one, you didn't really sound confident at all about that. When I said, does that make sense? You were like, yeah. Um, it does. Okay. Okay. Each of our M sub L values here will have its own set of m sub s values and so what that means is something looks like this we can have m sub l equals negative one and for negative one m sub s could equal plus or minus one half if m sub l equals zero well m sub s could equal plus or minus one half if m sub l equals one m sub s could equal plus or minus one half. So that's a lot of plus or minus one halves. In yeah. fact, how many total M sub S values can we have? Six. Six. Yeah. And here's how that's going to come into play. So we have two for n. And apparently I have one turning into two, and that makes no sense under the sun. What one means is a p. 
we have a P. We have in highlighted blue, negative one, zero, and one. So if we draw out our boxes, we're gonna have one box, two box, three box. And the reason we're gonna have three boxes that theoretically are all the same shape, I'm just really bad at that, is because M sub L would be negative one, zero, and one. Another way of writing that out would be 2px, 2py, 2pz. And if we were going to do the line notation, we would just do one, two, three lines. Again, with m sub l being negative 1, 0, 1, or 2px, 2py, 2pz. Why is where what's the x y z for? Okay, what's the x y z for? Good question. So the x y z is um, pa, 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 pa. go to slide. I don't know this one. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. So you see on this. Actually, let's go back here. Okay, great. When we talked about the uh, quantum numbers, we said the M sub L gives us orientation in space for our orbital. The X, Y, and Z are just designations for which coordinate, or like which uh, axis in a three-dimensional coordinate system does the orbital lie on. For a, P, a 2PX orbital, the two lobes are along the x axis for 2py it's on the y axis and 2pz it's on the z axis the orbitals look identical they're and all three of them exist it's just they because they can't occupy physically the same space they have to be um, oriented in space candy wapis to one another and this is how they are oriented in space candy wapis to one another Does that make that any makes sense? sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we've got here, uh, over here to the left, remember how I said drawing a circle or drawing a box was easier than drawing a circle? Mm -hmm. What we could have done was drawn this, this, and then trying to draw something in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Or we could do the same thing down here. And the those like this thing here and this thing here are supposed to be coming in and out of the plane of the paper. Yeah. See how the boxes and the lines are a little bit easier than drawing some of the orbitals? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's where the X, Y, and Z are coming from. Okay. Does that help? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Um, so if we go to the uh, writing material over here, um, we came up with the, or the reason we are now in P orbitals is because we still had one electron that we didn't fill based off of um, where we were. Because we had written out 1s2, 2s2, but that had only placed four of the five electrons that boron has. We have one more electron. So where is that electron going to go? In that first box. First box. Yep, first box. That's a great one. Spin up. Awesome. So how many electrons do you have in your P orbitals? One. Just the one. That's right. So this gives us, and we could put the, for the line notation, right? We just put the, ha the half arrow up. This gives us the electron configuration of 2P1. So for our boron, final answer, 
we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p1 for the electron configuration. If we were doing our boxes, we would write out all of those boxes in one line across. So, um, th but that would end up looking something like box, box, 1s2, 2, or oops, nope, 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 1s, and then we don't put the 2 there, we'd say 2s, and then we do 2p. And this time I didn't write out X, Y, or Z because it, we know uh, because it's a P designation that we have three orbitals. You don't always have to be writing X, Y, and Z. But if it makes you feel better, you could do that. But typically you're going to see it written like this. We said from previous slides or previous work, this was our box configuration. 1s, 2s, 2p, 1, da, 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 da. That's our lines. So far, so good? Yep. yep. All right, is it making more sense with the M sub S stuff now? Yes, a lot more. Good. Last thing then is our noble gas configuration. All right, so we're going back to the periodic table, hopefully. Okay, yeah, here we are. Here on the far right are, are our noble gases. Blah. Um, Punchline for our noble gases. Um, the noble gas configurations are going to start with one of our noble gases electron configuration. So here's like our helium, right? It's got two electrons in it. So if we think back to the hydrogen example, we would just put one more electron in there, right? So we'd have 1s2 as its electron configuration. So helium would be 1s2. Well, isn't this 1s2, oops, let's use a different color. This 1s2 right here, the same as that 1s2 for our, for our boron? Yeah. Yes. So noble gas configuration says to make writing out, especially like bigger elements like the potassium, easier. Instead of writing out all of the uh, electron configuration, let's just start at the most recent uh, noble gas and we'll just say, hey, it's got a full set of electrons just like the noble gas does, but here's how it's different. So the difference between helium and our boron in the example over here to the left is just this stuff. That's the only difference. So our boron, oops, let's use a different color, our boron would have the base configuration of our helium plus what's different about it. And you might be thinking, okay, that's really lame um, because it didn't really save us that much time. Once you get down to bigger elements like barium, you have 56 electrons that you need to place. And if you can place... 54 of them just by writing xenon in a bracket like that, your life is a lot easier. So each noble gas can be used for that row at the beginning. The noble gas can be used for the next row um, or for uh, ions as appropriate. The, so let me go to the periodic table. Um, let me see if I can zoom in. Enhance. Enhance. Enhance, please? No? Maybe? Zoom. Maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Nailed it. Thank you. And now it's not going to move. That's amazing. All right. You can see over my head now. Let's take uh, argon here, for example, as I select the entire periodic table. Argon. Trick for the noble gas configuration is... 
you have to have at least the same number of electrons as the noble gas does. So since argon has 18 electrons, any species that has 18 electrons or more, you could use argon um, as its root for the noble gas configuration. But if you couldn't use it for fluorine, fluorine's only got nine electrons up here. So it'd be silly to start there. But you could use helium. It doesn't really save you much because it's a small element. Um, do you want to do potassium real quick? Sure. Okay, let's do the potassium as an example. So if we go on the periodic table and we find our potassium, potassium has 19 electrons. Um, we're going to do the noble gas example for potassium here first. And then uh, if you have questions, we can go back and do the whole uh, caboodle. Actually, we'll do the whole caboodle, but I'll show you a little bit of a trick on how to make it faster. Okay, so noble gas. Noble gas. Go to the noble gases. Find one that has a similar or lesser number of electrons. In this case, it's argon. Argon has 18. So argon, so, so for potassium, 18 of its electrons are going to have the exact same configuration of ar as argons. So just by writing this out, we have knocked out, oh, you're like, what in the world? I've been writing this whole time. Okay, uh. so here we go. Potassium had 19, so we go to the noble gas. The noble gas of argon had 18 electrons. So we can say potassium has, a, has the exact same configuration of what are called its core electrons, the electrons that um, aren't the outermost electrons, the core electrons have the exact same configuration as argon. The valence electrons are the electrons that are further out. The valence electrons are going to be everything that are beyond what that argons were. So 19 minus our 18 gives us one electron that we need to place. Let's go back to our periodic table for a second. So here's our potassium. It's, remember that thing where I was saying, look at the uh, row it's in? So our potassium has is in row four. And... If we go up here to the top, it's part of this, um, what I call like the S block elements. And the S block elements are these first two, the alkali on alkaline earth metals. So everything that's in these two categories here on the far side, um, in the yellow and, and in the orange, Everything that's there is going to have a valence, its valence electrons in the S orbitals. Specifically, because it's in row four, it's going to have a principal quantum number of four. It's in that S block, and it's in group one. That means it's going to have one valence electron. Uh, did it again. Did it again. So argon is in row four group one. So it has one valence electron for S1. That make any sense? Yes. A little bit. Let's let let me show you the trick on the periodic table. And I'm gonna zoom this thing out. Nope. 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 Yep. 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 There we go. Okay. 
It's time to play Fall the Bouncing Cursor. We have one valence electron, two valence electrons. For lithium, we have one valence electron. For beryllium, we have two valence electrons. With beryllium, we said it's four electrons total, but because we're past helium now, all the, those first two electrons are gonna be counted as our core electrons and the two electrons beyond the core are, are our valence electrons. So four valence electrons. Boron is now over here in what we call the P block. So boron starts with our P block. It goes all the way over to neon. We can literally count this out and say boron is going to have one P electron. Carbon, two P electrons. Nitrogen, three P electrons. Oxygen, four. Fluorine, five. Neon, six. So we can count, like we can say, okay, we're in the P block, and we know it's the P block because it's six atoms across. And the six across corresponds to the six total M sub S values that we can have four P orbitals. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Neon, we would expect to have all six of its P orbitals completely filled. Mm, nope. We would expect neon's three P orbitals to be filled with six electrons. There we go. Nailed it. Bouncing ball thing making any sense yet? I think so. Let's try sodium. How many valence electrons would sodium have? One. One, yeah. Because it's group one, and it's past neon. So even though it's got 11 electrons, 10 of them have the configuration of neon. We've increased our principal quantum number up to three because we went down a row. So that one electron that's in the three principal quantum number that's our valence electron. How many does magnesium have? Two. Yep. So what is our electron configuration for magnesium? Uh, 3s2. 3s2. Yeah. So we could say our root is neon. 3s2. Or if we get real bored, we can say starting up here at hydrogen... 1s1, helium is 1s2, lithium is 2s1, beryllium is 2s2, boron is 2p1, carbon 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. Jump back over. 3s1, 3s2. Go over to your P's. 3p1, 3p2, 3p3, 3p4, 3p5, 3p6. Down to potassium. Do I have to go through all the, all the boxy things? You don't have to go through all the boxy things once you can use this like little trick that I'm showing you. But I'm, the people that I've showed the trick to immediately, they're kind of like, well, how does that work? But if I write out the boxes first and then I show the trick, people are like, yeah, of course, makes sense. So that's why I go through all the rigmarole first. Here's a trick, though. Look at the pink stuff. Maybe it's pink, orange, orange, pink. Uh, salmon. Starting here with scandium, 21. Those are our D orbitals. Starts over here at 4, right? Like it's in uh, row 4. Our d orbitals, though, the first time we have a d orbital is a 3d orbital. So the scandium is going to be 3d1, titanium 3d2, vanadium 3d3, 3d4, 3d5, 3d6, 3d7, 3d8, 3d9, 3d10, 3d11, 3d12, 3d13, 3d14, 3d15, 3d16, 3d17, 3d18, 3d19, oops, no, I missed one, 3d10. This is the zinc. There are 10 across here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep. And if you go through and you say, 
if m sub l is equal to 2, you have a total of 10 possible electrons that can fit in there. And hey, look, it's the d block, as this is called. And the d orbitals can hold 10 electrons, and there are 10 atoms across. Crazy, isn't it? Somebody spent a lot of time on the periodic table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the first part of chapter eight, which I'm not covering because it's just a history lesson. Um, it's important, but, you know, whatever. Even before we had this idea of orbitals, though, um, we had this idea of groups, and the groups were really powerful. Um, so, like, Mendeleev and whatnot, they weren't, they didn't have orbitals to align this thing to but what they could tell was that nitrogen and phosphorus and arsenic and antimony if you go down the picogens here um it sounds like a pokemon um phosphorus and nitrogen have very similar similar chemical reactivities why do they have similar chemical reactivities because they have the same number of valence electrons both of them have one two three valence p electrons and you can just count that on the periodic table over so things that are in the same group have the same number of valence electrons they're gonna have different core electrons right because they're in different rows um, but the groups they're gonna have the same number that's why oxygen and sulfur behave similarly um fluorine chlorine bromine iodine um our halogens, they behave similarly. They behave similarly because they all have seven electrons in their valency. And the seven is not coming from just the p orbitals, it's coming from the s orbitals as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to get over to fluorine. Yeah, so the periodic table is like stupid helpful if you know how to read it <laughs> if you know how to read the periodic table you're like you're set it's done it's over because like the last example species we've got is potassium cation good news is they're dumb easy um you just have to ask yourself what does a cation mean what's an, what's an anion mean so what does a cation mean that's the positive one. Yeah, yeah, we have removed one electron. So potassium here, right, as a cation is not going to have 19 electrons. It's going to have 18. Yeah. And if it's got 18 electrons, what does it have the exact same electron configuration as? Argon, right? Um, cause I can't say argon without acting like a pirate. Um, so that's telling you for potassium plus K plus, you don't write out argon in brackets followed by 4S1 because the 4S1 electron's not there. It's just going to go to argon. So you would write K plus colon argon. And that's the noble gas configuration for potassium cation okay that makes sense yeah and so this is why too um a lot of our ions have the charges that they do so if we go back to those halogens halogens like to form a negative one charge why would you want to form a negative one charge because if you form a negative one charge you go from having seven valence electrons to having eight and if you have eight, that means you have a full shell. And a full shell is energetically favorable, meaning uh, it takes less energy to have. Mother Nature is lazy. Mother Nature likes things to have full shells. So everything is trying to get its noble gas configuration by either gaining an electron, forming an anion, or for us, like on the f other side of the periodic table, losing electrons. So metals tend to lose electrons and nonmetals tend to gain electrons. And we told you that, but we never told you why. And it's because of this electron configuration stuff. Or it can be rationalized because of this electron configuration stuff. Now your head really should be blown. 
I mean, maybe not. It's up to you. A lot to uh, process. Yeah. Yo. Yeah, we covered a lot today. I did not intend to cover all of that. But it's good. It's good. 